So uh, to give everybody some background before we talk about the book and the 25th anniversary of the book, you are originally from? Uh, Philadelphia. And you went to college? Okay. Hello, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, okay. <laughs> and so you went to college at? Brandeis University, where Maury was. And why did you pick Brandeis out of all the colleges you could have gone to? Well, uh, I went to college out of 11th grade, and uh, I decided to go kind of late in the process. And uh, my father actually said if I skipped my senior year, he would buy me a used car. So I said, OK, I'll go. And I, I started looking in the college book. Uh, but I didn't have a lot of time, and I got to Brandeis was in the B's, and the University of Chicago was in the C's, and I applied to those two schools. Okay. And I got into Brandeis, and uh, I went up there, uh, liked what I saw. It was small, and decided to go there, and uh, told my father I'm going to go to Brandeis in my senior year instead of high school. And he said, great, and he never bought me the car. Oh. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, that was a tricky thing. So <laughs> what did you want to do? What did you study at Brandeis? I wanted to be a musician. So the fact that I went to college at all was a bit of a miracle. I didn't want to go to college. I just wanted to start my life as a musician. And uh, you know, I, I came from a family that said that that's fine. Music is fine, all good. You're going to college. You don't have a choice. And so when I got there, I wanted to be a musician, actually. I started studying music, but I took a sociology class. I had signed up for that sociology class. And what's funny is um, it was like a 101 sociology of beginning class with Maury Schwartz. No idea who he was or anything like that. And I walked into the class on the very first day of school, and there were nine kids in the room. And being a typical freshman, I said, no, 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 no. There's, this is too small. If I cut it, they'll know I'm not yeah, here. No place to hide. Yeah. So I was actually leaving the room to drop the class, to go to the registrar and drop the class, when Maury, the teacher, started to um, call roll. And one of the problems when your last name begins with A, <laughs> you can't get out quickly enough. And so he said Mitchell album. And I was literally, David, I was literally halfway out the door. And if I had kept walking, he wouldn't have known because he didn't know it was me. And I always think back to that moment and say, if I had just kept walking and dropped the class, I'm sure I wouldn't be here with you. None of this would have happened. Instead, I slid back in out of guilt, and I raised my hand, and I said, here. And he said, is it Mitch or Mitchell? Which do you prefer? And I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but I had one of those names that, like, you could be Mitch or Mitchell or Mitchie or whatever. And so I said, well, Mitch, my friends call me Mitch. And he said, Mitch, it is. And Mitch, and I said, yeah. And he said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. So I knew cutting the class was out of the question at that point. Okay. All right. So you stayed in the class, and I presume you enjoyed it? I did. And you graduated? Um, <laughs> I think. Maybe. maybe. So you eventually graduated. And then you decided not to go into music, but to go into sports writing. Is that right? Well, it wasn't that quite that linear. Oh. Uh, I, first of all, I, I, I majored in sociology, not because I was all that interested in sociology, but I had all those I took every class that Maury offered. I think there were eight or nine classes. I, I, I wrote my honors thesis with him um, so that I have a chance to continue to hang out with him. Uh, we would walk around campus together. We would eat lunches together. It was really more like an uncle-nephew kind of relationship. And then I graduated, and I went overseas, and I worked uh, uh, in music. And I actually had a very cool job as a singer and a piano player on the island of Crete. Uh, in this little fishing village called Agios Nikolaos. And I should have just stayed there the rest of my life because they paid me like $350 cash. I had my own little bungalow on the Aegean. Uh, I, all I had to do was sing like a, a half an hour with the band, American songs. And I actually, it was such a little remote place. Now it's become quite, if anyone's gone there, it's become quite touristy. But back then, no Americans were ever there. And so I was known as this like American singer, and I would sing these Elvis Presley songs and everything. I swear half the people thought they were originals, you know, like they, <laughs> and and I used to be able to like walk along the mountains and things like that, and and uh, uh, you know people would stop their cars and say, 
Oh, American, get in the car. Come on, we take you up to the, you know. So I didn't have to drive anywhere. I didn't have to pay for a drink. I didn't have to do anything. And like a fool, I left this job <laughs> willingly because I wanted to get back to New York City, you know, to start my career as a musician. And uh, I got to New York City, and all I did was meet other musicians who said, if one day I could ever get to Greece and just, you know. Like, <laughs> Were you the only Jewish person on that island? Probably. Uh, I'm Pretty sure I was. There was. You couldn't, yeah. couldn't get a minion there, I guess. Okay. No, yes, there were no So, minions. okay, so you come back and you're a musician in the United New States. New York. All right, and then what was your, what instrument did you play? Or do you were a singer? Uh, well, I was a piano player, was my main thing, but I wrote songs and I went through the whole starving artist thing and I did showcases and clubs and all the rest of that stuff. And after a couple of years, I realized that, you know, the lights weren't all going to turn green for me. Oh. And I remembered, um, once I was trying to find a new bass player, and I had a bunch of guys, they had put an ad in the Village Voice, and guys would show up for interviews, and I had guys coming in who were like 45 years old, and they were coming in to be in my band, and I didn't have any gigs, you know, I, we didn't have any money or anything, and, and, and they would just go from one place to the other, and I realized, like, that can be me, you know, like, what, what's, what's gonna be any different between me and them? They're twice my age, and they're still looking for jobs, so, it wasn't really working the way I wanted it to, and at the same time, um, I went into a supermarket, for those who want to be writers, and I, I know that there are a lot of people at writers, um, you know, at, at, at book festivals who want to be writers, and I, I often meet people who say, well, I feel like it's too late for me, you know, I'm, I'm 16 and I haven't written a novel yet. <laughs> so let me be the, not the first, but the, you know, one of many people to tell you there's no such thing as, as starting too late or there's no such one path to get into it because I was a musician, I walked into a supermarket um, and I had a little basket and, and uh, they threw a local weekly newspaper into my basket and on my way home I, I read it and it said at the bottom, it was just a little giveaway weekly, but it said at the bottom um, we need help writing the newspaper, if you have any spare time, contact us here. So because I worked at night as a musician, I had my days fairly free. So I went over to this newspaper, walked in, and I was like the youngest person by about 77 years. And, <laughs> and um, they said, they gave me an assignment. The first day I walked in, and they said, okay, there's a, you want to help us? There's a parking meters uh, meeting. And, and go cover it. So I, I'd never written a thing before, David, nothing. And, um, uh, but I had seen all the president's men. So <laughs> I, did what, I did what, you know, you do. You get a pad and a pen and you ask a bunch of questions, such as you can ask at a parking meter meeting, you know. And then uh, I had read a lot of newspapers, so I just kind of mimicked the style. Like the first paragraph kind of says what what you're writing about, second paragraph is a quote, third paragraph kind of expands on the first paragraph, that kind of thing. So I wrote it up, I turned it in, and the next week I went back to the supermarket and there was a newspaper and I picked it up and my story was on the bottom of the front page, which proves A, that there was nothing happening in New York that week, <laughs> apparently, uh, but B, you know, I saw my name, and on something that I had written, and I got this little tingle inside, you know, like, hey, I created that, and that's my name, and I was hooked, you know, and I became a writer basically, you know, formally that day, and I began to work for that newspaper on a volunteer basis, and for young people, I, I say this all the time, you know, don't worry about how much money you're gonna make at your first job, worry about what you're gonna learn at your first job. And I didn't make a dime. I worked for about six or seven months for free, but I learned everything because it was a small paper. I, I learned how to set the ads. I learned how to do uh, copy editing. I, I learned how to write every kind of story because they used me you know, or, wherever they could send me. And by the end of that year, they had started paying me $25 a week, which I thought was fantastic. And uh, I had enough clips that I applied to Columbia uh, Journalism School and actually got in and um, that started my career as a journalist. Did you go to Columbia Journalism? I did. Okay, I went to so Columbia Journalism and, you might find it interesting, Columbia Business School, which is something I don't tell anybody. 
uh, but uh, I actually got an MBA from. Uh, you have an MBA as well. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't want to do something important like private equity. What is private equity? No. The um, high, highest calling of mankind. No, the, <laughs> that's what they said in business school too. <laughs> no, actually, uh, I, I, I went and they had a program where you could, uh, if you got into the journalism school and you got into the business school, you could combine the masters and do them in like six months less time than it would have taken you to do them together. And I thought, I just went to business school to understand economics because at the time inflation and gas prices, and this was the early 80s and all that was very much front page stuff and I thought I don't really understand this stuff. I go, I'll go to business school for a year and kind of learn how it works. It'll probably make me a better journalist. So uh, while I was there, of course, business school, you know, it, it's very much about like the interviews you get at the end. And, and these interviews would come up with Procter and Gamble and, you know, uh, uh, McKinsey and all these places, and I had no interest in any of that, and you were given a slot, uh, you know, like a lottery, and so my, I would get lotteries with these interviews, and I didn't want to go, so I, I became like the most popular kid in business school because I gave them away to people who wanted to wanted that work, and I never took a single interview when I was there with any company because I knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do, but I actually have an MBA from Columbia, which I just finished paying my student loan for about... <laughs> Wow. About you should have, a little too early, apparently. Yeah, you should have waited. Uh, the federal government would have yes, paid off for you. should have them. dragged it out a couple more years. So, uh, okay, so you got a job in the sports writing area, is that right? Yes, uh, interesting story with that. Um, I, I was not interested in sports in particular, but while I was at Columbia, um, there was a job on the job board at Sport Magazine, and I needed money to help pay my tuition. I you know, put myself through school. I worked as a piano player at night to help pay my tuition for, for uh, Columbia. And so I got this job at Sport Magazine and I started writing little articles for them. And then, you know, I got a couple more sports things, whatever. So when I graduated, I wanted to be a feature writer. I wanted to write like Tom Wolfe, sort of like Sunday Magazine pieces. And there was an advertisement in Editor and Publisher, which was the magazine back then, if you want to get a job in the journalism business, for it said, uh, feature writer wanted for Sunday Magazine in Southeastern Daily. They didn't tell you what the paper was. So I, I got all my clips together, which were pretty much all sports clips, and I sent them off. And I didn't hear from them, and I didn't hear from them, and I went overseas to uh, the um, track and field world championships in Finland. I was covering them for uh, a freelance for track and field news. And while I was over there, I was in a hotel room, and the phone rings. I pick it up. It's all scratchy, you know, like overseas. <laughs> and I hear this voice says, uh, is this Mitch album? I said, yeah. This is Fred Turner. I'm the sports editor with the Fort Lauderdale News and Sun Sentinel. I said, okay. He said, you know that uh, Sunday magazine job you applied for? I said, yeah. You didn't get it. <laughs> I said, okay. You called me all the way up in Finland to tell me I didn't get a job? He said, well, the guy who was looking at that job, he saw that all your clips were sports clips, so he brought them over to me, and I've been reading them, and they're not bad. If you want a job in sports, I got one for you. So I flew home from Finland. I went down there. I got a job as a, as a feature writer in sports, and I've been writing sports ever since. All right. So you were doing that, and, um, and then what happened is, how did you get to Detroit? Uh, well, I worked in Fort Lauderdale for two years, and uh, then Detroit, uh, the Detroit Free Press had a columnist named Mike Downey, who some of you might know, and he, went up, he left there to go to Los Angeles, so they had an opening, and they wanted a younger writer, and I had won some awards that had gotten me some attention, and I was young, and um, they flew me up there, and then, interestingly, there's a newspaper, was a newspaper war going on in Detroit between the Free Press and the news, and so when the Free Press which had this opening, was going to hire a new young columnist. The news decided whether they were going to hire a new young columnist, and they interviewed me. They offered me to come interview, too. So I actually flew up there on the ticket from the Free Press and stayed the first night at the hotel on the bill of the Free Press. The next morning, I checked out and checked back in without ever leaving, and now I was on the bill of the news, and I flew home on the okay. news. And after taking those two interviews, I was offered the job at both places for exactly the same amount of money. 
which makes me wonder to this day who was talking to who back then. Uh, but I decided to go with the free press. It seemed like a more um, okay. so you did aligned that paper. For, and how many years were you doing I'm that? still there. It's oh, thirty. Thought, it's thir it's uh, 1985, so whatever that is. you were a daily is. reporter or feature reporter? No, I was a columnist. Columnist, I was a columnist. Okay. Hired as a columnist, yeah. All right, so you did that for many years. Yeah. And then you're watching um, Ted Capo on uh, Nightline. Nightline, yep. And what did you see? Uh, well, 16 years after I graduated Brandeis, uh, and promised on my graduation day to Maury that I would stay in touch with him. I still remember I, I gave him a briefcase on my graduation. Uh, I had never gotten a, a professor a present ever, and I'm sure it was the cheapest briefcase in the world because I didn't have any money. Uh, but he took it around and he was always like admiring like it was made out of gold. And he, he, he said, Mitch, you're one of the good ones. Promise me you'll stay in touch. I said, I will. Promise. I said, okay, I promise. Say it in a sentence. <laughs> I said, okay, Maury, I promise I'll stay in touch. I promise I'll stay in touch. And then I graduated and did all these things that you, you just didn't asked stay in me touch. about. And didn't, not even didn't stay in touch. I didn't even call him. For 16 years, not even a phone call. Uh, I was so busy being ambitious and following my career. And then at age 37, when I had achieved quite a bit in the sports writing world, I was on ESPN. Regularly, I, I had a daily radio show. I wrote five columns a week. I wrote for magazines. I was going 90 miles an hour. And I happened to flip on the Nightline program, and there on the screen was a thin, white-haired, sickly-looking version of my old professor, Maury Schwartz, talking to Ted Koppel about what it was like to die from Lou Gehrig's disease. And that's how I discovered that he had it. So when you saw that, did you immediately contact him and say, now I want to come stay in touch? Or what did you do? No. Uh, first, I, first I swallowed hard, and then I uh, tried to deal with how ashamed I was that I hadn't contacted him in all those years. And then I tried to work up the courage to make a phone call to him. And all I was going to do was make a phone call. That's how magnanimous I was in those days. And I still remember, to this day, exactly how that phone call went, because I practiced the line. You know, I wrote out the words. And I called his number, a nurse answered. And she handed him the phone. Now, when I was back in college, I used to call Maury coach, like a sports affectation. I coach, how you doing, coach? And I had totally forgotten that. So when he, I heard his voice on the phone, he said, hello. I said, hello, Professor Schwartz. My name is Mitch Album. I was a student of yours in the 70s. I don't know if you remember me. And the first thing he said to me after 16 years, how come you didn't call me coach? So needless to say, by the end of that conversation, I was going to visit him. Guilt, very powerful motivator. Uh, so I arranged to go visit him. That was supposed to be a one-time visit. Uh, I was still so wrapped up in my work life that when I went to actually go to his neighborhood, I rented a car at the airport, I rented a cell phone, I was on the phone with ESPN talking about some piece we were doing, and I drove down his block, and unbeknownst to me, it was a warm day, and his nurses, he had asked his nurses to bring him outside so that he could greet me on the curb. And I'm coming down the street, and I see him in his wheelchair, and I hit the brakes. And of course, the right thing to do would have been to take the phone and throw it out the window, go out and give this man a hug who I hadn't seen in 16 years. And I would love to tell you that that's what I did. But you that's didn't. not what I did. What I did do was continue that conversation on the cell phone, but drop down below the seat. And I laid on the floor, pretending like I was looking for my keys or something so that I could finish and he wouldn't see me. Because uh, at that point in my life, work came first and everything else could wait, even a dying old man, which is a sad thing to admit about yourself, but it was true. All right, so you got out of the car eventually? Yeah, about two hours later. All right, and you saw him and greeted him, and what did you say then? Uh, he said, let's go inside and eat something. I think that was the first thing he said. Uh, which is kind of funny because when I used to eat with Maury when he was healthy, he used to talk all the time while he was eating. And 
you know, he always had these big ideas like, you know, follow your heart, follow your dreams, don't worry about your grades, don't worry about how much money you're making, but he would forget to chew, you know? <laughs> and if you, he used to eat egg salad sandwiches, I remember, and you'd be sitting across from him and these little yellow projectiles would come <laughs> flying out of his mouth. So when he, he said to me, you know, let's go eat, I thought, hey, egg salad again. But um, we went inside and that was really, David, my first face-to-face -face exposure with the ravages of ALS because I watched him try to eat a piece of tomato, I remember, and his hand was shaking so much and it fell off. And then he had to go at it again and then it fell off and he finally got it up to his mouth and then the chewing took so long and the swallowing took so long. And, uh, you know, I, it was my first kind of dead-on realization that this was a ravaging disease. Now, for those who aren't familiar with that disease, it's a progressive uh, neurological disease for which there is no cure. That's right. um, you can maybe moderate the impact, but there's no cure for it. It's a death sentence, is that right? Pretty much. I mean, there are some people who defy the odds and just sort of plateau at a certain level of devastation, um, but for the most part, it's usually a two to five year progression to death and he, you know, they usually don't diagnose it until about two years in. So as they said to Moore, you might have a couple years left when he was diagnosed. So um, after you had your conversation with him, did you say, I've now met with you, I have came back and thanks very much for meeting with me, but I'm not going to come back again? Or did you say, I'm going to come back again? It was more like uh, Maury said to me at the, well, I, I was only going to stay for an hour and I ended up staying like six hours, and I, I took the last plane home, and he had said to me at the end of it, uh, Mitch, dying is only one thing to be sad about. Living unhappily is something else. And when I flew home that night, I realized that, you know, I was 37 years old, perfectly healthy, he was 78 years old and dying, and he seemed 10 times more satisfied with his life more content with his existence than I was. And I realized there was something the matter with that equation. And he had said to me, <clears throat> remember when we were in college, you used to, Tuesdays used to be our day, because I used to do uh, my honors thesis with him, and it was, we would meet on Tuesdays. And I happened to go see him on a Tuesday. So he said, you want to come back next Tuesday? You know, and I was like, eh, <laughs> really? Uh, but I did, and, um, and then I ended up coming. There was a little gap. I went to Wimbledon, and then I came back, and I started going every, every Tuesday. Tuesday. And many, then it turned out all the Tuesdays that he had left. For how many years was that? It wasn't years. It was months. Uh, but, um, well, we recorded 14 Tuesdays in Tuesdays with Maury, but there were a few more. I would say it was, it was probably about 16 or 17. So you were recording these because you intended to write a book? Is no. That? No. Um, I was recording them because I remember I bought, I always had a little tape recorder with me because that was a tool of my trade. You know, when you're a sports writer, you always have these little micro cassette recorders you hold up, you see them on, you know, when athletes are being interviewed. So I always had one with me. And about the second or third visit, I started, I said, is it all right if I tape this? And he said to me, um, he said, sure, sure, sure. Uh, and I said, I just want to listen to it one day, and then I kind of trailed off, and he said, when I'm dead. And I said, no, no. And he said, yeah, it's okay. You can listen to it when I'm dead. Saying dead is not a bad word, you know, and that's really what I wanted. I could tell that he was giving me a lot of things, that, a lot of wisdom that I would want one day. So we were recording these sessions anyhow. The book only came about by accident when he said to me one time, I asked him what he was afraid of, and he said, I'm afraid of dying a second time. I said, what does that mean? He said, he said first I'm going to die the way that I'm going to die, and then wherever I am and I realize that my family is going to have to sell the house and get rid of everything to pay the bills that I'm leaving behind, then I'm going to die again. I'm going to die twice. And that's when I found out how in debt he was for all the bills that he had accumulated over the last couple of years because ALS is, as you point out, is a progressive but slow disease, and, and he had, you know, massage people and, and, and therapists and all this stuff, a lot of stuff that wasn't covered, and they weren't well-to-do, 
and he didn't have a particularly good settlement with Brandeis in terms of retirement and things, so he didn't have the money to pay it. And so I got the idea that maybe I could write a book to help him pay his medical bills. That's the only reason, folks, that Tuesdays with Maury ever came into existence, or even as a concept. Well, the, uh, the book turned out to be an incredible bestseller. Did the publishers know that at the beginning? Were people interested in this book? No. It was quite the opposite. Um, I went around to every publisher who, who would even deign to visit with us, and almost every one of them said, not interested, boring, um, you're a sports writer, what do you know about that? One publisher said to me, I won't say who, because they might have relatives in the room, but uh, <laughs> that publisher said to me, um, you don't even know what a memoir is. Come back in 20 years, maybe you'll understand what a memoir is. So uh, I remember leaving that guy's office with my literary agent, and I was like in tears, and I said, well, why don't they just say no? You know, like, why do they have to rip you to shreds and then say no? Um, so I, I've, always, I've always enjoyed the fact that Tuesdays with Maury is now referred to as the best-selling memoir of all time, <laughs> because uh, I always wonder what happened to that guy. But uh, I think he's in the food services industry. So you, you visited Maury was how many times? 14 times? Or well, no, it was a little more. But yeah, we recorded the 14, 14 times. 14 times. But we didn't. There's an interesting thing with that. Um, we found one publisher a few weeks before Maury died. Um, Doubleday, who was willing to give us enough money. I just wanted enough money to pay his medical bills. It was a labor of love. Nobody thought it was going to be a big book, no, including Doubleday. Um, and um, I remember I went to Maury and I said, hey, I got some good news, because I hadn't told him I was trying to find a publisher. He wanted me to write a thesis. <laughs> and I didn't have the heart to tell him I wasn't enrolled anywhere, so I don't know <laughs> how you write a thesis when you're not in an actual university. But I went to him and I said, hey, I got some good news. Um, you know, these conversations we've been taping, I found a publisher wants to put them into a book. He said, really? Who? And I said, Doubleday. He said, ooh, I heard of them. And I said, yeah, but not only that, they're going to give us some money and I want you to take all the money and pay off your medical bills and don't die twice. And, you know, he started to cry. And, and I always say for me, that was kind of the culmination of Tuesdays with Maury, my Tuesdays with Maury, because I had finally learned to do one nice thing for this older man who had done so many nice things for me. So he died uh, roughly how many months after you began seeing him? Less than a month. No, after you began seeing him. Oh, uh, seven months, eight All right. months. So when he died, then you started writing the book? Yes, I didn't write a single word of the book until after Maury died. So he, he's, he never read and a word. how long did it take you to write the book? It took me about less than a year. Uh, I only had one directive when I wrote the book in mind, and that was to keep it short and simple. I thought this, the worst thing that I could do with a book like that was to try to show off flowery writing about death. You know, I wasn't going to have sentences about, you know, the dark apocalypse of death descended on the room. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I just thought, just say what happened. It was, it was so sweet and, and so moving to me. Just write what happened. And interestingly, the contract, which I had never really had a contract like that. I had written two sports books before that, and I always kind of knew the parameters of sports books, but I didn't really understand this kind of a book. The contract called for a 320-page book. So in those days, I was still using you know, typewriters and printouts and stuff like that. And, and so I did it, and I like triple spaced it and everything. And, <laughs> and I had about 300 pages, and I turned it in. And uh, after I turned it in, a couple weeks later, I got a call from the publisher, and they said, hey, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? They said, well, we typeset this, and it's like 160 pages. And I said, well, that's all there is. You know, uh, that's the whole story. It's, I don't have anything else to say. And to their credit, they said, all right, don't worry about it. We'll just make it a smaller book. And so if you've ever seen Tuesdays with Maury, if you have a copy of it in your hands, it's a little book, right? Well, the reason they did that is because if they made it a full-size book, it would have looked like a comic book. So, um, so they made it small. And then after Tuesdays with Maury became successful, all my books are now hobbit-sized. <laughs> so, so now you signed away the royalties to his family. I gave them so all you, the money. So you, you have not received any royalties. No, that's not true. 
Uh, I gave them all the advance. Okay. And if you understand the book business, I imagine many of you do. So you get an advance for writing a book. Most of the time, you don't clear that advance. That advance goes against the royalties. Um, but if a book becomes successful, really successful, then you can surpass it. And Tuesday's what Maury did. So I went to Charlotte, his wife, <coughs> and I said, there's going to be more money from this book. And I don't want it. I didn't write it for money. You take all the money. And she said, I don't want it. <laughs> I didn't do the money. So we ended up splitting it. Okay. And uh, half of the money to this how day. Many, how all, many all copies have now been sold? I believe it's in the neighborhood of 18 to 20 million. Okay. So it's yeah. one of the best selling books of all time. So um, now, today, you spend your time writing other books, but you do one other thing that we talked about just earlier. You have. Uh, in effect, created an, an orphanage, I guess it is, in, in Haiti. Is that right? Operated an orphanage in Haiti, yes. And why did you, I mean, I, nothing wrong with that, but how did you happen to come to Haiti, and why are you now going there for, what, every couple of weeks or so? So I went to Haiti after the 2010 earthquake to help a pastor uh, who said he had an orphanage there that he thought had been destroyed. And uh, we were able to get in a couple of weeks after the earthquake because I knew the senator who was on the Armed Forces Committee. And so we went in before anybody was able to fly in or anything like that. And what I saw was so devastating um, that it never left my mind. And the orphanage, fortunately, had not been destroyed, but it had been overrun with people. And it was just a disaster. I mean, the place was, I, I hope they never see anything like that again. There were people dead in the street. There were people covered. And everybody had white dust all over them. And there was triage going on wherever you looked. And mountains of rubble with people climbing on it, trying to pull rocks out because they thought there might be a loved one lost inside of it. And at the orphanage, I just kind of fell in love with the kids. Um, and I started bringing guys back from Detroit. And we came back the next month and the next month and the next month with builders, contractors, plumbers, roofers. And, and we built the first toilets that the place ever had and the first showers that it ever had. We built a kitchen. We built a school. But while we were doing all that stuff, um, the kids were still eating like one cup of rice a day. And so I said to the uh, pastor, I don't understand. Like, we're coming down all the time. What's going on? And he said, well, I don't have any money to run this place, to be honest. I'm 84 years old, and I, don't ha I never had any money to run it. And so in one of those moments, like that moment with Maury, where I decided to go in or out of the classroom, I said to him, I blurted out, uh, well, I could, I could probably run this place if you want me to. I run some charities in Detroit. How hard could it be? <laughs> and uh, he basically said, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Here it is. <laughs> and uh, and I've, he, he's gone. He, went, he disappeared. And, and uh, I've been running it ever since. So, and I made every mistake you can possibly make. But... I've also had every blessing that a human being could so ever how many, have. How often have you, you I go, go every month, starting from then, so it's almost 13 years. I'm there every single month without fail, and uh, we've admitted over 65 new children. Uh, they come in when they're very, very young. Uh, these are kids who have been abandoned or left to die, uh, uh, dropped off at medical clinics, and nobody ever comes back for them. Many of them we have to invent birth certificates because we don't even know when they were born or what their names are. But they're the most loving, wonderful, gracious, faithful kids um, whose total possessions can fit in a 12 inch by 12 inch cubby. And uh, they go to school four hours a day in English, four hours a day in French, in a school that we created. And every one of them has a college scholarship lined up and waiting for them uh, should they make the grade. And so far, we've had eight who have come out, and all of them have made the grade. My oldest one just graduated 4.0, summa cum laude, and he's going to go to medical school. And one of them is right over here. Stand up. Edney is right over here. He's a sophomore. So that's a big part of my life. And, and David, if I, if I can relate that to Tuesdays with Maury, because I know that's why people are here. So you would say, well, why, why did you get involved with stuff like that? So when I was visiting Maury, I noticed something would happen uh, on a regular basis. People would come to, to cheer Maury up. Uh, people who, you know, they didn't know him that well, but they saw him on TV and they were, you know, and they came and they had always had a strategy. They would have pictures or photographs of their kids or something and say, I'm going to tell them funny stories, jokes. And they would go into the office where he was, you know, frozen in his body with ALS, couldn't move, you know, and the door would close and 
they would come out an hour later in tears, but they would be crying about their love life, their divorce, their job, their whatever. And they say, well, I don't know what happened. I went in to try to cheer him up. But after about five minutes, he started asking me questions. And so I started talking. He started really asking me questions. I started talking. And then he started really, and I started crying. I was, you know, I wanted to try to cheer him up, but he ended up like giving me therapy and cheering me up. So I saw this happen so many times. And finally, I said to him, I don't get it. Like, you're the one who's dying. You know, you can't move. You need someone to turn your head just so that you can look at them. You've hit the mother load of sympathy. You know, why don't you say, let's not talk about your problems. Let's talk about my problems. And he said to me, Mitch, why would I ever take from people like that? Taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And it is a profound <laughs> sentence. So, and I have found that, I have really, I never forgot that moment, and I, I never forgot that sentence, and I have tried to live my life as best I can towards that direction and have found that I do feel way more alive when I give. And what, like I always say to my wife, we have a very nice house in Michigan and we have a really good mattress. It's, a, it's like a hundred inches or whatever. And in Haiti, we sleep on this four inch mattress and it's, you, know, you only get power about eight hours a day if you're lucky and it's always stifling hot. So, but I always sleep so well in Haiti. And I always say it's because I'm doing something that matters. You know, I know I'm actually needed here. So on ALS, for those who aren't familiar with it, your brain stays pretty much the same and your ability to talk and so forth, if you can communicate, is still good, your brain's working. It's the rest of the body that deteriorates, is that right? So when you, can, exactly. you were seeing Maury, he, his brain was as sharp as it had ever been, it's just the rest of the body was deteriorating. That's the cruelest part of that disease. And for Maury, he was lucky because he could still talk right up until the end. And we've made, since Lou Gehrig famously got this and it was named by some Lou Gehrig's disease, we've made modest progress in curing this problem and no progress in figuring out where it really comes from. Is that right? That's pretty accurate, yeah. There have been some small developments in, in staving it off a little bit, but nothing right. close to a cure. Okay, so we have 10 minutes left and we have time. Mitch has agreed to have answer some questions. If anybody has any questions from the audience, go up to the mics and ask your question and uh, just make it a question, not a statement if you could. And um, anybody have any questions? Anybody stand up? If not, I have some more. Oh, there's one, okay. Good afternoon. Hi. I, um, I have a question and a statement. I just think your books are absolutely beautiful. Thank you. But my question is, what is your writing style? Your characters are always so developed. Like, what goes into creating your characters and your, and your book ideas? Um, well, thank you for the nice words. Uh, I try uh, to have an idea before I write a book about the concept that I want to write about. A lot of people create like plots or things like that and then go from there. I don't ever do that. I, I, I say, all right, I want to write a book about like the five people you meet in heaven. I didn't want to write a book about heaven. I didn't have that idea. I wanted to write a book about the fact that people think they don't matter and everybody matters. I had an uncle who just you know, thought he didn't matter and he was a nobody and that's how he used to talk. And I said, I, what can I come up with to get that concept? And that's when I come up with the idea, well, what if, okay, how about if a guy goes to heaven and he meets five people from his life who tell him how he mattered on earth? So it's, for me, it's the concept first and the character second, you know, as opposed to someone gets an idea, I want to write about a stockbroker, and then they try to create a story. So I always, and, and David had asked me, do you know the endings of your books when you start? And the answer is yes. Like, I always have to have sort of a North Star that I'm sailing to. And the five people you meet in heaven, for example, I knew who the fifth character was going to be. If you've read the book, you know that that's a very important part of that story. Um, but I have a lot of writer friends who say to me, oh, I don't know where a book is going when I start it. I just let the characters tell me. And I said, what do you mean you let your characters tell you? <laughs> you know, like, I open the drawer, my characters are in there. If I said to them, tell me where we're going today, and they'd go, hey, we're on the clock here, you know, like. <laughs> You created us, you tell us where we're going. So I have to have kind of the, the point of it in mind before I go on. So I should have Thank asked you, you uh, there was a TV uh, 
a documentary about, not documentary, uh, a TV movie. show, movie. And um, Jack Lemmon played uh, Maury. I forget who played Hank Azaria. You. Who played you? Hank Azaria, yeah. And did you want Robert Redford or somebody like that to play you? Or? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't, I didn't give it a lot of thought. I went to the movie set uh, one time. Um, <laughs> I walked, I, I'd never been in a movie set before, and Oprah Winfrey made the movie, and she invited me to, uh, to come to the set, and I just drove myself there. Uh, and I guess nobody ever drives themselves there, so I pulled up, and they told me where it was, and I saw a door. I wasn't sure if it was the right door, but I thought, well, this must be the door, because there's a red light outside, and it's spinning. <laughs> so I just went to the door, and I opened it up, and I didn't understand that a red light spinning means that they're filming. So I opened the door, and I heard, cut! You know, who is that? Wait, wait, wait. And, and then somebody said, that's the guy who wrote the book. Oh, oh okay, well, come on in. And so I ruined the, I, I arrived, and I ruined the take. Okay. Question here? Yes. Um, I read, read a number of your books, but I actually have a question about your sports writing career. Okay. Um, so as a person who writes for Detroit sports and with football starting this season, what do you think of the Lions' chances? We were having such a good time. Why would you bring Sorry, me down like that? Uh, the Lions are... Uh, Hopefully you can bring hope. I, I, well... Yeah, that's a lot of hope. Uh, you know, I, I, I keep saying I'll keep writing sports until the Lions win a Super Bowl, and I think I'm running out of time. Let's put it that way. All right. Thank you. Right here, question. Hi, good morning. Um, I just wanted to say that I always, I've read your book so many times, and I've always felt so moved by them. And Thank so you. kind of what was the hardest, like, scene for you to write in Tuesdays with Maury, and how did you go about that? Uh... <clears throat> Probably the, uh, the final one, uh, to try to get across what it was like to know that you weren't going to see him again. And it was pretty obvious to me. And, um, you know, when I, it's worth mentioning since we're wrapping up, the last conversation that Maury and I had, really, um, he said to me, uh, I want to ask you a favor. He was in bed. I remember that, and he had never been in bed before. He was always in his office. Maury always said, if you're in bed, you're dead. And so he never wanted to be in bed, but he was in bed, and that's how I knew we were at the end. And he was so small, his body was so withered up that under the covers he looked like a little boy. And he held my hand, he was squeezing my hand, he said, I want to ask you a favor. I said, okay. He said, after I'm dead, I want you to come to my grave. I said, well, I was going to do that any. I said, not the way everybody else comes. Don't leave the car running, get out, put down flowers, get back in. Come when you have some time, bring a blanket, bring some sandwiches, and talk to me. And I said, wait a minute, you want me to come to a cemetery, have a picnic at your tombstone, and talk to the air? And he said, exactly, just like we're talking now. And I said, well, Maury, it's not going to be like we're talking now because you won't be able to talk back. And he looked at me as if I were being very naive, and he said, well, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm dead, you talk, I'll listen. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure I understood at the time that I was writing the book the significance of that little interaction. But I do now, and that is that if you lead your life as Maury did, if you make people a priority and experiences with other people a priority, not work, not money, but people, then when you die, you're not 100% gone. You live on inside the heads and the hearts of everybody you touched. And they can talk to you, not ghost seance talk, but they talk to you because they hear your voice. You know, how many times after someone's passed away and you're at Thanksgiving, you say, oh, if Uncle Jack was here, he'd say, those mashed potatoes are no good. But because you remember the sentences that they put inside your brain, right? But if you spend all day working like I had done for so much of my life, or, you know, trying to get famous or whatever it is, then when you die, you're not, you're really gone, you know, because you didn't spend any time giving away that voice that's inside you. And so when Maury says, you know, you talk, I'll listen, the reason I can sit here with you 25 years later and remember everything he said is because he spent all that time with me, even when he was dying, putting that inside me. So it rings around in my heart and in my head even after he's gone. 
So that okay. was the, the toughest okay. thing to write, but the most significant one, too. We have two minutes, so is there one more question? Or is that? No. Okay. Yeah, well, they're, right they're here and there. Right here. Where? Oh. Yeah, one more question. Okay. Hey, hello. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Read you for so long. I think I first read you in high school when you were writing about the Fab Five. Yeah. And so I was really engaged, and then I fell in love with Chick Bonetto and Wolf for One More Day. Thank you. As well as the class I was teaching. Um, a bunch of kids that were sort of pigeonholed and thought they were one thing. And I was wondering if you could talk to students today. What would you recommend to somebody who was sort of wanted to be more than one thing? Society sort of put them in one place. That's a great question. And, um, you know, I asked that same question of a woman you probably never heard of named Maya Angelou. <laughs> she came to do a radio, uh, I'm kidding about the never heard of. Uh, <laughs> She, she came to do a radio interview at a place that I was doing a show. And after she was done, this was when I was trying to get, I was writing Tuesday Sports Morning, there, I, there was some pushback of people saying, you're a sports writer. You know, what are you writing a book like this? You're a sports writer. And I said to her, do you ever have anybody tell you, because you've written plays and movies and songs and books and fiction and nonfiction, you ever anybody tell you, just stick to one thing? And she said, Yes, I have, and it's the cruelest thing that you can say to anybody. And I say, why do you say it's cruel? And she said, because it's like telling a bird not to fly. And I always remember that. I said, well, if Maya Angelou is getting it, then I can certainly put up with it uh, because, um, you know, she proved them wrong. And uh, that helped me. You know, I ended up, I've written plays, I've written musicals, I've written movies, I've written uh, screenplays, uh, you know, nonfiction, fiction, sports, not. and. Um, I've always felt I'm a storyteller. That's all I really know how to do. I, I don't have no other talents, but I can tell a story, and I can tell it in different forms, and nobody should tell any of your kids, students, or anything to be one thing. Who says? You know, People who want other people to be one thing are just dissatisfied that they can't be the one or, or more than one themselves. So uh, I would encourage them to do everything. Be birds, fly. You know, and tell them my Angelou said it, not Mitch Album. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank, thank you, you very much, much uh, for this. Thank you all. Yes. Okay. So um, if people want, and Mitch is going to be here to sign books, and you can find out where it is, and he'll be here to sign your book. And uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, Mitch. Thank you all.